add some rules here. Let's do some rules. Okay, oops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, rule number one. Okay, put the homeowner in the driver's seat. Okay, what do I mean by that? Anybody let me know. Tell me what you think. Put the homeowner in the driver's seat. They get the first right of refusal and who can gets in there. Okay, so yes, what you're what you're saying is is let them approve or disapprove your tenant buyer before they move in. Right. Right. So this becomes more of a cooperative sandwich. You guys know what I mean? You've heard me talk about cooperative assignments. That's where the homeowner is in the driver's seat over there. We're going to do an assignment. And he's okay with it all. All right. Well, in this case, we're not doing an assignment. We're doing a sandwich. The same principle applies. Work with the homeowner like a cooperative sandwich. Make sure that he's okay with what's going on there that he knows what's happening. Okay. The next thing is, oops, sorry. Don't spend all of your option fee. Okay. Actually, let me change this upfront option fee. All right. Don't spend it all. Why do I say this? Somebody help me out. Because if, if the buyer, tenant buyer doesn't, make your payments, you might have to make them to the seller yourself. Deal emergencies, right? Right? Deal emergencies. What happens if the you're in the middle here and the tenant buyer moves out in month number six? If the tenant buyer moves out in month number six, what happens? Well, somebody becomes a tenant buyer, right? Well, yeah, you'll want to find a new tenant buyer. But uh, I'm responsible. Yeah, somebody's going to have to pay that bill, right? And yeah. the seller is going to be looking at you. So it's nice if you've got a nice fee up front. If you just take a little bit, put it in the savings account, and don't touch it. Now, if if you're not good at that, okay, I don't want to step on anybody's toes here today, but if you're not good at that, you better make a change, okay? Because you can't have a successful, I don't know that you can have a successful anything if you spend all your money all the time, okay? And I mean successful marriage or <laughs> whatever it is. Business, you can't have a successful business if you spend all your money all the time, okay? <clears throat> you have to find a way to live underneath, live below, beneath your means, is that what they say? live below your means. Okay. And this certainly applies to the sandwich business. Okay. If you're going to be in the sandwich business, have a little cushion that you put back and don't touch. You will thank me later at some point. Okay. All right. Uh, let's do another one here. Give yourself a longer term to complete the transaction, then you give your tenant buyer. What do I mean, somebody? Help me out. Give yourself a longer term to complete the transaction than you give your tenant buyer. You want to have enough cushion. You need to have enough cushion to protect yourself. So even if the person leaves, you have enough time to get another one in. And you, I would, if it were me, I would give myself at least one year cushion. So if I give it out for three, I have it with the seller for four years. There you go. Or if you have it with the seller for three years, then you'd have it with your tenant buyer for two years. Two years, yes. At that least one year. Because yeah. things like this pandemic really created havoc everywhere. So you never know what may happen. So before, if you gave yourself a three month, six month cushion, double it. Awesome advice. Anybody want to add anything to this? 
Also, you know, your tenant, it might be something as simple as your tenant buyer just needs a little extra time to get the loan done, you know, and that, that'll help you with that too. Okay. Here's the next one. So I think someone maybe put something in the chat. No, that's coach Steve one in the room. Okay. He's in. All right. Here's the next one. <laughs> Screen the heck out of your tenant buyer. Okay. Let's talk about this for a minute. What's the first thing we want to know from our tenant buyer? I want to know how much money they got to put out. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. I like I like to know this one first. <laughs> we'll get to that one though, Lashonda. <laughs> Make sure they want to rent to own instead of just rent. Yes, sir. Do you want to rent to own or just rent? Because I'm not interested in just renting. See, if I'm going to sandwich a deal, I better have a committed tenant buyer, not just a tenant, right? Because I'm going to make sure, I want to make sure this guy's going to perform as much as I can. All right. So that's the first thing. Do you want to rent to own? All right. Here's, here's the second thing for me. Okay. Do you have two years good rental history? And here's how I like to ask it if I ask it verbally. If I talk to the your landlords over the last couple of years, would they have any bad stories for me? Okay. Now, they're going to lie. They're going to tell me whatever they want me to know and nothing else. Okay. I get that. Later on, I'm going to ask them in question number five or six or seven or whatever it is. I'm going to ask them if they're okay with me checking their background and their rental history and their income verification and all that. So we're going to flush out liars. Okay, for the most part. So I'm not too worried about that. But but I like to ask initially because if they come right off, and a lot of times these tenant buyers will, all right, they'll come off with this. Yeah, uh, well, I was evicted six months ago and uh, been living with my brother and stuff. Okay, but I really like to own a house. Yeah, well, okay, well, I really would like to fly too without wings, but I can't. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. So this will this will help me flush out some real boneheads in the group. Okay. Uh, let's. What's the next thing? The next thing is, uh, what's your job history? What am I looking for here? Good. Good income. Study income. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's change that. Let's say job and income history. Okay. What else might I be looking for here? Besides just how much money he makes, wh where he works. Yeah, I work at eight, I work at the bubblegum factory and I make about $3,900 a month. Is that before or after taxes? Well, that's after taxes. Okay, great. About $3,900 a month from the bubblegum factory. What else do I want to know about his income or his job and income history? The history or the job in general? Yeah, maybe both. Yeah. What are you thinking, Sandra? Well, I was going to say when the job, you want to ask them, you know, how much they make a month to make, to see if that's going to, if they can even afford the rent. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to know if $3,900 is what he says is his income every month. Well, we're going to need the payment to be somewhere less than a third of that. Okay, so if he's making $3,900 a month, what's a third of $3,900? I got my calculator here. Let me, let me do it. $1,300. So, so this guy, he better, he, better not, uh, he better not be applying for my property where I'm asking for $1,800 a month because he can't afford it, right? So, but now if, if I'm asking in that range, okay, $1,000 to, to $1,200 to $1,300, Okay, maybe maybe we can do something here. Okay, he's making enough money at thirty nine hundred. What else might we want to know about jobs? How long Anybody? Been there? I'm sorry. Say that again. How, how long have you been, been there? Oh yeah, how long you been there? Why is that important? I, sorry, I 
I just talked over somebody else. I think that's okay. Uh, why is it important that uh, we know how long he's been on the job? So we can see if uh, if he's a, a solid tenant. Yeah, he's he's right. able he's able to to uh, hold a job. Right. Yeah, he might just be really good at getting jobs, and then he don't stick to it, right? Right. <laughs> also, how long do you have to have a job before you can uh, in the same type of industry before you can get a home loan? Does that years. does that mean anything to us in this situation as a sandwich? Sure. Heck yeah. Talk to me about it, Jason. What do you think? Yeah, they're all, they're always going to look for stability. You know, it's at least a at least a couple years in the same. Even if you took another job, they want to see that you're at least in the same industry anyway for a couple years. Yeah, a couple years. Yeah. See, if I was a if I was a preacher man at a church. And then I quit there and then I went and I was a janitor for six months and then I got a better job working over at the train yard. Uh, well, I'm sorry, you, that's just not gonna do. This, this person's not stable enough. They need to have had the job for a couple of years. A couple of years of good rent history, a couple of years of great job history. Okay, now we're talking about something. You making enough money to make the payment? Okay, now we're getting closer, okay? I'm going to ask them here if they will be willing to uh, submit, I guess is the right word, to a criminal rental and income verification checks. Does that make sense? Sure. Mr. Tenant Buyer, you know, I'm going to make sure that, you know, I run you through the checks here. You know, if you've been fibbing to me, we'll we'll find out. But uh, there's nothing you need to tell me about now, is there? I mean, I'm not going to find a bankruptcy or a bunch of default credit cards or anything, am I? <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, Justin, that sounds like an uncomfortable conversation to have. Okay. <laughs> yes, but you got to... You got to spine up here a little bit and handle your business. This is a big asset and you control it. Okay. You're going to stay in the middle of this. You want to work with the best people. Okay. Here's the, here's the last one or not the last one, but uh, have you already spoken to a home loan lender and got a uh, plan? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. This is it. This is in our paperwork, by the way, that we, especially in the assignment game, where we we tell them, you know, hey, sign off on this disclosure, and part of that disclosure is, you know, they've been told, hey, you need to go talk to a home loan lender. What might a home loan lender tell them? <laughs> nobody knows okay um, this part of your homework assignment go call go call a home loan lender and tell them you want to uh find out what it'll take for you to buy a home that's all you got to do and then and then they'll tell you oh your credit score is too low or you're gonna have to have this much money down what else might they tell you was that sandra was going to say something they, would they ask me probably how long I have to kind of see if that even works in terms of how long um, the period is. Like, you know, if it's like, if I have like one year to buy it or something like that, it's, they might, you know, say like, we don't see that happening in that time period. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm gonna... Yeah. Uh, ultimately you're, you're right on target because what we're going for here is, mm -hmm. is when they talk to a home loan lender, the home loan lender is going to ask them the same stuff. Are you looking to buy a home? You are? Okay. Do you have one picked out yet? No, you don't? Okay. No problem. Um, have you been renting? How long have you been renting? Okay. Do you have any evictions? No, you don't. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your work history. Okay. They're, see, they're going to go through the same stuff I'm just quickly asking them about. And then they're going to say something like this. Okay. Well, your FICO score is uh, 610. And so it's going to be hard for us to get a, a, 
a, a really good rate for you. However, if you were able to take, uh, take a little money and pay off ABC credit card and XYZ credit card and pay down this debt over here a little bit, that would put you in a better position. It would probably raise your credit score and uh, you probably we could probably get you qualified for this loan in somewhere you know six months to a year if you were able to do that right away okay so that they'll develop help them develop a plan like that okay the reason and not all mortgage guys will do that that's the crappy part but um, a lot of them will just be like yeah you qualify no you don't qualify sorry call call again later okay all right. Well, any good real, uh, mortgage guy, though, will help coach them a little bit on what's going on uh, with their credit and, and what J what Jason just put there in the chat with their debt to income ratios and all this, so on and so forth, to help them develop a plan. OK, um, I, I tell people to call Rocket Mortgage if they don't have one. And I tell them, hey, listen, you don't need to use Rocket Mortgage, but they'll help you develop a plan. Ask them how long, ask them what items you need to do, what you need to do to qualify and how long you, they think it will take you. Okay. All right. And they'll, they'll help you with that. All right. So it's okay to coach your tenant buyers, especially if you're going to be in a sandwich. All right. To, to go ahead and visit with a home loan lender and find out this plan. All right. Any questions on that? Anything? Okay. I hope all that makes sense to everyone. All right. Um, here's the last thing here. Um, we want to find out how much money, right? This is LaShonda's question. <laughs> how much money do you have to invest in your new home, home purchase, right? Yeah. All right? All right. I like it. See, because I, I can say it that way because I'm going to deduct their down payment off of the purchase price, right? So it, yeah, how much money do you have to invest in your new home purchase? That's actually a question, not a statement. Okay, now let's go on. Here's another rule, okay? Pay the seller's mortgage payment for them, okay? Somebody help me out, <laughs> what do I mean? Pay the seller's mortgage for them. How would I do that? Why would I do that? What do I mean? Help me think through it. Taking the money that the um, from the um, tenant buyer. So I'm going to be collecting money in a sandwich. I'm going to be collecting money directly from the tenant buyer, and then I'm going to be paying it either to the seller directly, or I'm saying right here, uh, pay it directly to the seller's mortgage. Right. Company. All right. Do you use an escrow company or do you do it yourself? You could use an escrow company. I, I've done it myself and, and like to do it myself, but I might change that here in the future. Okay. okay. This is going to be a uh, really, really big thing here coming up in the next couple of years, I, I believe. And I'm going to be doing a lot of sandwiches, so I'm probably going to have to do, you know, an escrow company. But that's okay. Uh, that'll work too. And have the tenant buyer pay them and have them pay the mortgage company. But paying the mortgage for the seller gives me peace of mind. What's it called when you pay rent and then the, the, the landlord keeps the rent and spends it on uh, playing golf and stuff <laughs> like that? And he doesn't pay the mortgage with it. What's that called? It's called something. It's, it's, it's against the law. But what, what's it called? Fraud. Well, it could be called fraud, maybe, but there's a more particular name for it, a more specific name. Anybody know what it is? Trouble. <laughs> What'd you say? I said trouble. Yeah. Somebody said shitty. That's pretty shitty. Yeah. It's called Cold rent. Medium. I'm sorry, Rick. No, never mind. Go ahead. No, please do, Rick. It wouldn't really be considered like commingling of funds because it's you're not dealing with like an entity against another. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I think they look at it just really simply uh, here in the state of Missouri, they call it rent skimming, rent skimming. Gotcha. So I'm not paying the mortgage. I'm, I'm, I'm skimming this rent right off the top from myself. And uh, that's problematic. 
problematic. You can get in trouble for that. That's for sure. So this helps you, you know, stay on track with the mortgage company, making the mortgage payment directly to them. So it's a good policy to have. All right. Um, I've also um, sent it directly to the seller, but had access to view the account. Okay. Online. So I, I would be able to see, or he would send me a copy of it every month. Okay. I've done that too. Uh, of the account statement showing it was paid. Rick, did you have something you were going to say, sir? Do you, are you recording the option there in your state? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, that's like the next, uh, the next rule. Oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. sorry okay. Ahead. Um, let's, let's move on here. Okay. So here's, here's the next one. Um, get proper insurances. Okay. All right. Get proper insurances. So the homeowner will need a landlord policy. Tenant buyer will need a uh, renter's policy. Does that make sense? Okay. If you don't do this, what happens? Well, the house gets struck by lightning because you didn't cross all the I's and dot all the T's. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's how the universe works is when you forget to cross all the I's and dot all the T's. The house gets struck by lightning and it burns down. And then the insurance company says, no, we're not going to pay for that because uh, you were using it as a rental property. But we had a we had a homeowners living in their policy. Now, it could happen. Could happen. I don't know. If you question that, you could study that, I guess. But yeah, so they need a landlord policy and the tenant buyer, they're going to need a renter's policy. Very, very inexpensive, very inexpensive, probably less than 30, 40, 50 bucks, depending on how much rent they're paying, how many private personal goods they have inside the house. What does renter's insurance do? Somebody tell me, what does a, a renter's policy do? What does it cover? Personal belongings. Yep, it does. So it'll, it'll, it'll cover personal belongings in case of a break in or things like that. Is there anything else it might cover? Yeah, it fire. covers. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Antonio. A uh, fire or water damage, personal injury. Yep. All of that stuff. So if your friend comes over, if the tenant buyer's friend comes over on a weekend and he slips on the ice and he busts his ass, and he wants to file a big lawsuit against, you know, people. Well, there's everybody's insured. Okay. Right. What, what if the tenant buyer burns the kitchen down? Well, instead of the landlord having to sue the tenant buyer to recoup damages on his house, he's got insurance. Okay. All right. So tenant insurance, renter's insurance, very important on a lot of different levels. All right. Make sure they have it. All right. Here's the, here's the next one. No rent credits. Okay. What do I mean? Somebody real quick, tell me what do I mean by no rent credits on your sandwich deals? Do not ever use rent credits. That's my advice. You might disagree. That's fine, but no rent credits. Why do I say that? Can you do rent credits with the seller, Justin? Yeah. See, now you're getting, you're twisting my arm now, Larry. Okay. <laughs> See, I think it would be okay if I got rent credits, but I don't want to give rent credits to my tenant buyer. Okay. So why would I want to give rent credits to my tenant? Not Why would I not want to give them to my tenant buyer? Okay. Anybody? Because that's, um, take it. That's, um, uh, when you, when you giving them the credit, that's, um, less money that's being deducted because you it's like you're giving the money back in a sense yeah yeah one i don't really need to okay because they'll buy the deal without rent credits rent credits meaning every time they send me a payment on time a rent payment on time i credit them fifty dollars off the purchase price or something okay 
so they would they would act, actualize that equity when they actually buy the property. But that's what a rent credit is. And and I, I've been advised and told to avoid doing rent credits because it will keep me safe from violations on the Dodd Frank Act. Bingo. Okay. The Dodd Dodd Frank Act is has a lot to do with owner finance and you know uh, doing things the right way, protecting the, the buyers and all this good stuff. And and it's just more simple. I, I don't do rent credits. Just just advice from me. But but you might you might research that and find find a way that you can do it safely, and that's okay too. But I'm I just like to be real simple and and just don't do it. All right, here's the last one. Are you ready for that? All right. Use separate lease and option agreements with your tenant buyer. Okay. Why do I say that? Use a separate lease and option agreements with your tenant buyer, not a combination. Okay, a combination agreement is a lease option agreement. It has the lease and the option in it all in that one agreement. Never use that with your tenant buyer. Always use a lease agreement and then a separate agreement that is an option agreement. Okay. Why do I say that? Anyone? Because if, if, if it runs into a legal issue... Um, that could be a problem in, in court. And then also if the, if the, uh, tenant buyer is not paying is you could use that lease to evict them. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go to evict them and the court looks at your document and they say, oh, well, this is a lease agreement. Is this the lease agreement? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Well, this also looks like it has some options to buy and some things going on in here. They put down a, a sizable amount of money. Looks like it was to be credited towards the purchase price. Um, you've been giving rent credits here every month, kind of like an owner finance deal. Uh, we're going to throw this out and you might seek foreclosure. <laughs> oh boy. Now you just went from eviction to foreclosure. Okay. Using separate agreements will help in this matter. Okay. All right. The last one is record your option to purchase at the local courthouse. Okay. Actually, let's go back to eight real quick. Kind of like we did with rent credits. I don't mind if the seller gives me rent credits. I just know I'm not going to give rent credits to my buyer, my tenant buyer. I also don't mind if I use a combination lease option agreement with the seller. Like I'll use the combo agreement with the seller, but with my tenant buyer, I'm using two separate agreements. Okay. Again. Okay. So again, it's kind of a little bit of a, it's, you know, I don't know. It's one way for me and another way for thee. <laughs> That's horrible, but that is the way it works. Okay, and the last Just, one is, yeah, go ahead, Steve. You know, Dodd-Frank was written to, to protect the consumer. It's got nothing to do with a business transaction. It's got nothing to do with business to business. So if you're dealing with a wholesaler, you're out of luck. The, the government doesn't care what, whether, whether they help you or not. They're not going to help you. As far as the consumer side is concerned, any transaction that you handle, which can be looked at, as the customer, your buyer or tenant buyer, whatever, getting any form of equity is considered a finance transaction and subject to Dodd Frank. So listen to what I just said. If you're going to give, if you're going to give anybody any kind of credits or or whatever or as 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 they make their payments, you're subject to Dodd Frank. So the simple thing to do is keep it separate, and you want to do everything you can to take your lease agreement and your option agreement and treat them both as separate agreements. I even mark my option agreement the next day. I don't even say we even did them the same day. They're two separate agreements. So uh, that's all I got. Yeah. 
try to try. You really, really, because you always want to go into these things. You know, everybody goes into it with the eyes wide open. It's all going to be a beautiful sunny day. And all of a sudden, when the shit hits the fan, you got a legal problem. And a lot of attorneys don't even think, they don't think that far ahead. So you got to be able to protect yourself and know where you're going. It's a good class to, 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 to find out. So keep it going, man. Thank you. Uh, record your option to purchase at the local courthouse. That's the last one. Uh, that's the last rule. Now, you could record your option. You could record a memorandum of option, or a me you could record a memorandum of agreement. Okay, probably better to do that. Um, all that stuff provided in the VIP Quick Start course. All right. So you can record your option at the local courthouse. Why would you maybe consider doing this? At some point, at some point in the deal, why would you maybe consider doing this? Seller can't sell it from underneath you without clearing it. That's so true. That's so true. Any other reasons why? Okay, I'm just going to throw this out there. And let's talk about it if you want to, but this will help you get paid at the end <laughs> without having to do a, uh, a double close or a, some kind of a other arrangement. Okay, this will also help you get paid in the end. This will help you put your marry your seller and your tenant buyer together and collect your pay at the end. Okay, so be prepared for that all right and maybe you wait to the end to do it i don't know maybe you know maybe you do and then you you use the title company to record your agreement okay your memorandum of agreement I, so just be prepared for it though.